Okay. So, um, Francis, we usually stop for questions towards the end of the session. So, Saurabh and Deepa, one of you will be doing the question answer. Fine. So, let's just give maybe 10, 15 minutes towards the end. Yes, no problem. I, I think it will end 10 to 15 minutes before the hour, um, or I'm happy to stay either way. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, but you know, we'll try our best to end on time. Do my best. Absolutely. No worries. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. It's 4 p.m. I mean, look at that. Uh, no one, I mean, I, I hardly knew how two minutes flew by. So welcome everybody. Good to see you, all 44 of you. And I'm sure you're going to be filtering in as uh, as the webinar proceeds. And the, you know, you're open to attend. We are not closing the entry or anything to the webinar. So people can keep attending right till the end. So welcome. Uh, this is the third webinar in the series of big questions, innovative approaches and idea that stemmed from Saurabh and Deepa and a conversation that's led to this series. Uh, over the previous two se sessions, we've had um, uh, you know, uh, very well-known scientists from across the world, Spain and United Kingdom, talking to us about their science, sharing their science with us. And today we have uh, another uh, eminent scientist from the United Kingdom who I will leave to Saurabh and Deepa to introduce. We're just leaving at uh, this that India Bioscience is very happy to bring cutting edge science to researchers in India. And uh, to make full use of the opportunity, please use the chat window for your questions and we will take them as the, as the session proceeds. All right, thank you, Saurabh and Deepa. You can introduce Francis. Thanks, Karishma. We're absolutely delighted to have Professor Francis Brodsky with us today. Uh, Francis is at the Division of Biosciences of the University College London. And Frances really doesn't need much of an introduction, especially to this audience. She's a global leader in the field of Clathrin biology, and her group has made some amazing contributions in understanding, uh, you know, the field of Clathrin biochemistry structure, and also how Clathrin mediated pathways are involved in, uh, you know, receptor signaling, immune response, and even uh, and other uh, aspects. And recently. Her group has made, uh, you know, knockouts for the light chains, and that's really been a turning point in our understanding of clathrin biology. Uh, her group also discovered the function of a second human isoform of the clathrin heavy chain. And today, Francis is going to talk about the genetic diversity of clathrin subunits in tissue-specific membrane traffic. Uh, welcome, Francis, and we're really delighted to host you today. Thanks very much, Deepa. Can you see me? Yes. We can see you and hear you. Very good. Well, um, hello to everyone out there, all of you in India or Austria or wherever you are. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to join this virtual symposium. So today it is my pleasure to share our recent work on how the genetic diversity of clathrin subunits enables tissue specific membrane traffic. So one of the current challenges of cell biology is how all the simple intracellular pathways that we have defined over the past 50 years, years or so in model organisms and cell lines adapt to the complex demands of specialized cells in differentiated tissues. So we've been trying to understand this tr transition to complexity for, for clathrin-mediated transport, a process that my lab has studied for many years. In this talk, I'll try and emphasize the innovative approaches that we've taken to address this question. Now, I need to change my slide. So let's see how that works. There ah, we go. Yes. Okay, very good. So the formation of clathrin-coated vesicles is, well, is a well-characterized mechanism for um, specifically moving membrane associated cargo from one location to another within the cell. So the, this is the diagram of it, the inside of the cell and the blue and the red um, part of the cartoon show where clathrin functions in the cell. Um, and these pathways where, that it mediates contribute to both general cell function and to tissue specific functions, um, which are uh, summarized here. So, Receptor-mediated endocytosis contributes to nutrition and signaling. It also has a role in infection and in synaptic vesicle regeneration. Intracellular clathrin transport contributes to organelle biogenesis and antigen processing and binding. And 
a uh, clathrin function in the trans Golgi network also contributes to formation of secretory vesicles, which is important for hormone secretion. So clathrin itself was discovered in 1975 by Barbara Pierce, who named it for its Greek base, clathrate, which means basket-like. And it has this fantastic, oh, may I probably can use the pointer here, has this, um, that probably works, um, this triskelion structure, and this is an electron micrograph of what clathrin looks like in the cytosol. And um, it self-assembles in the cell to form a lattice and these lattice-covered coated vesicles. And we know from many structural um, studies over the years, and this shows one of the first cryo-EM structures, how the clathrin triskelion uh, inter interacts with itself to form the lattice coat. Um, so, Beyond this structural analysis, many labs have contributed to understanding how this beautiful coat is created in the cell. And um, what we know is that um, clathrin is attracted to membranes by these adapter molecules, which in turn associate with membranes by interacting with phospholipids. And the clathrin assembly into that lattice coat is triggered by the interaction with adapter molecules so that gathers these molecules together, which sequesters various cargo with recognition sites for adapters um, into the clathrin coated vesicle. And that um, captures um, the vesicles into the vesicle for uh, removal from one membrane and delivery to another membrane. The clathrin then comes off and the vesicle goes on to fuse to um, deliver its cargo to the next step. Now, this step happens at the plasma membrane for endocytosis, but it also happens um, intracellularly for moving cargo from one intracellular compartment to another. And the regulation of those locations where clathrin assembly occurs is mediated by a different adapter molecules, which attract clathrin assembly to different membranes within the cell. Now, um, I'm happy to talk about adapters later with questions, but I'm mostly going to focus on clathrin itself today and how it influences these pathways. And so the composition of conventional clathrin is um, a three-legged um, molecule, which is formed from three clathrin heavy chains, which trimerize at their C-terminus. And um, conventional clathrin has subunits called clathrin light chains, which associate with the center of the molecule. Um, the, both the heavy chains and the light chains um, have, have, have um, increased diversity that was caused by gene duplication that occurred um, when vertebrates emerged. So whole genome duplication, which is one of the processes which leads to vertebrate complexity, produced two genes encoding two clathrin heavy chains, CHC17 and CHC22, which are named for the human chromosomes where those genes are found. And then local gene duplication during the same evolutionary period produced two genes encoding clathrin light chains, uh, light chain A and light chain B. Now, um, because there's two genes encoding clathrin heavy chains, that generates two forms of clathrin. Mm -hmm. And um, we, what you can see here is that they actually look very similar. These are electron micrographs of both forms of clathrin. You can see that they both form triskelia, and you can see that um, and, and, and have generally basically the same shape that would go into forming a clathrin lattice. Um, a big difference between the two is that um, the CHC17 clathrin is the light chain binding and CHC22 clathrin does not bind the clathrin light chain subunits. Now, the two heavy chains don't seem to mix in the cells and that's probably because they come, a, come off the ribosome at the same time. So you get separate clathrins formed in cells. Um, and in cells, we also see that they do not Co, they do not co-assemble, so they do not form mixed lattices of the two. Um, and again, that's uh, probably because of the way they're attracted to membranes and they're regulated in cells. So the CHC17 clathrin is the conventional clathrin that you learn about in textbooks. So that is the one that has light chains. It's the one that mediates endocytosis, lysosome biogenesis, uh, a secretory granule formation, and generally the pathways that are thought about when you think about clathrin um, membrane traffic. Um, now the um, 
CHC 17, CHC22 has a more, it, and, and CHC17 is in all tissues and it's also found in um, all eukaryotic organisms. Some version of the heavy chain and the light chain are present throughout eukaryotic evolution. Um, CHC22, um, as I'll discuss later, emerged um, um, when vertebrates emerged, as I just said, and um, it is mostly expressed in muscle and fat, and I'll talk about its function there in the second part of the talk. Now, um, so first I'd like to address the um, what the light chains do for CHC17, and then talk about diversity of light chains that was produced by the gene duplication that created two light chains. So the light chain subunits, as I said, associate with the center of the clathrin molecule, um, and in a region that we call the hub, which is basically from the, the, the knee where this leg bends to um, the trimerization domain. And we know from a structure that we solved years ago done by Jeremy Wilbur in my lab with, in collaboration with Robert Flederick at UCSF, that the light chains interact. Um, you can see where, how they interact. They're shown here. Now I hope, now what's gonna happen here? Supposed to be able to make this movie go, um, but I'm not, it's not going, no. If I turn off the pointer, can I, yes, if I turn off the pointer, I can make the movie go, sorry about that. Um, so this is a 3D picture of how the light chains associate with the heavy chains from the center of the molecule to the bend in the knee. So we're just looking at the hub region here. And what you can see is that they extend all the way from the center, bolstering the trimerization domain, but also interacting with the knee, which we've characterized as a labile interaction. And actually the light chains um, come off as clathrin, come off the knee as clathrin assembles, they remain associated with the rest of the molecule. And that gives the knee flexibility to form the lattice. So the light chain um, contribute to controlling the assembly of clathrin triskelia. Um, so as I mentioned, during vertebrate evolution, there was a gene duplication that led to two clathrin light chains, A and B. And um, they are 60% identical in sequence and share some conserved elements. So the, um, they share a heavy, a heavy chain binding region um, in the center of the molecule, and they share a consensus region of only 22 contiguous residues. So the rest of the molecule, the rest of the proteins are somewhat variable between each other. And um, the, the sequences of A and B are highly conserved during vertebrate evolution. So it's very obvious to, to pick out a light chain A and a light chain B in any species, any vertebrate species. Um, the conserved sequences link the light chains to um, actin processes by binding an actin regulating protein called Huntington interacting protein or HIP. And both of the light chains have splice variant variation in neurons. Um, LC CLCA can um, ac acquire two exons and um, CLCB can acquire one new exon, uh, forming short hydrophobic sequences in the in this region of the protein. Um, and they have very variable um, splicing also in heart and skeletal muscle. So light chain A and light chain B have characteristic tissue expression, and most tissues have equal amounts of both light chains. <clears throat> And lymphoid cells to carry out immune functions have primarily CLCA and, and a tiny bit of CLCB. So um, we've been interested in trying to understand um, what is the function of this light chain diversity that is so well conserved in vertebrates. And we've taken three approaches to that question. We've looked at different binding proteins that bind one isoform and not the other. We've made light chain knockout mouse, mice that um, Deepa mentioned earlier, knocking out one uh, a gene encoding A or the gene encoding B. And we've also looked at the biophysical properties of reconstituted clathrin um, with the uh, individual light chains. So as far as the binding protein interactions go, um, 
we a few years ago in a study with um, Simona Polo's lab, uh, um, we discovered that a splice variant of myosin 6 um, is in competition with hip binding to CLCA only and not CLCB. So that seems to regulate light chain or clathrin interaction with the actin cytoskeleton, and that, that, that seems to play a role in um, epithelial cell polarity. We've also recently completed another proteomic study where we found a, another specific light chain A interaction interactor called CC2D1A, which is um, has a gene product that's been implicated in um, autism spectrum disorders. So the light chains bind different proteins. Interestingly, and I'm not going to go much into this data, light chain A binds a lot more partner proteins than light chain B when you look at the proteomics overall. And um, has so it has more more activity, if you will, in terms of recruiting interacting partners. So for the for the knockout mice, um, they've been um, a challenge to characterize, I should say, but we've been able to get some information out of um, our studies of these mice, and um, because the light chains have some shared properties. Um, the, the mice that are completely knocked out for light chain A or light chain B, some of them survive. And that's very useful because we can actually study what the defects are in, the, in their surviving tissues. Um, so 50% of the mice that have no light chain A um, die, but there seems to be no um, problem with the survival of the light chain B knockout mice. Um, we find that with the light chain A knockout mice, as they age, they go on to develop, so about 40% of them go on to develop a uterine condition called pyometria, where the uterus um, becomes um, swollen and permeable to inflammation, inflammatory factors. And it looks to, it is, it seems to be associated with some defect, specifically in the uterine epithelium of those mice. We also note that there's a mild rate reduction for both mice with A mice more knockout, A knockout mice more affected than B. And there's neurotransmission defects in both mice. Now, clathrin mediated proteins are really important in neurons because they're important for um, recapturing synaptic vesicle proteins once synaptic vesicles merge with the cell surface. And so um, it's interesting that in both mice, we have neurotransmission defects. And what we find is that in the A knockout mice, we have a reduced number of synaptic vesicles. And in the B knockout mice, we actually have an increased number of synaptic vesicles. And this shows that an electron micrograph of those um, synapses. So this is a wild type mice um, control with the synaptic vesicles lined up on, an, on a synapse um, shown here with this thickness. And this is an A knockout mice. And you can see there's a mouse and there's a lot fewer synaptic vesicles. And here's a wild type mice part um, litter mate pair for the B knockout mice. And here's the synaptic vesicles at the interface. And you can see that there's a lot more synaptic vesicles in the B knockout mice. And if you, um, this is um, obviously a micrograph but can quantify this and that definitely holds up. And um, if you measure electrophysiology signals from these animals, the A knockout mice show less um, synaptic activity and the B knockout mice show enhanced synaptic activity because they have more vesicles. So looking at the biochemistry of the difference between, differences between the two light chains, um, we've used a reconstitution system on liposomes that was initially pioneered by Ernst Ungewickel and Ungewickel's lab and carried on by Philip Danhauser in my lab and ultimately Lisa Redlingshofer. And what we were able to do is make clathrin heavy chain, reconstitute it with neuronal light chain A or neuronal light chain B, um, and use that clathrin to bud vesicles off of liposomes, where you recruit the clathrin to the liposomes using a piece of an adapter molecule. And what we find is that the A alone gives you some buds. The B alone gives you some buds. You can see these buds coming off the liposomes with the clathrin coat. But when you mix the A and the B together, you get a lot more buds. And so the budding efficiency is increased when you have both light chains together um, compared to each light chain alone. Right, so I've told you a lot of evidence from protein binding, uh, knockout mice and biochemistry that um, suggests that 
the, the differences between A and B are important and um, has led us to a new idea about what the light chains are doing for clathrin. So it seems clear that light chain A has the basic light chain functions to make clathrin work. So the knockout mice have more severe phenotypes than the B knockout mice. You can see that with the synaptic vesicle reduction, and you can see that in all of the phenotypes we measured, and also it's showing up in the uterine uh, defect, which is not showing up at all in the B mice. Um, the light chain A um, has functions that B doesn't have, and that could be mediated by the fact that it binds um, a, a larger subset of proteins um, to interact for to create to bridge interactions between clathrin and other um, process pathways. Now, we know from biochemistry that we did many, many years ago that light chain A, light chain B competes with light chain A when it's present. So our thinking is that it's acting as an attenuator of light chain A function. If A is the main, A has the main functions, binds the most proteins, then when B uh, displaces it, that clathrin will bind fewer interacting proteins and B will also bring in a few of its own interacting proteins. So um, there are tissues um, that have very little B expression, but all tissues have A expression. So that suggests to us that B is expressed in tissues when A's activities are needed to be tweaked or attenuated. And then from the biochemistry, we know that to combine the two light chains, you improve membrane deformation. So our thoughts are that the combination of the two light chains is what's really important for clathrin to function. Um, and that the balance of light chain A and light chain B in different tissues, which is highly maintained every time you measure a tissue from an animal or a person, it seems to retain that ratio of light chain A to light chain B. Um, so that's, um, probably creating a balance that's important for various specialized pathways in that tissue. And so we think that B is acting as a modulator of A function. And I think this is sort of a lesson in uh, complexity in that one's thoughts were that, oh yes, knock out A and knock out B and we'll find out what each one of those does. But what we actually have is a system where they're cooperating with each other. So it's much more challenging to pick apart how that balance works and what the what each one contributes to the subtle functions of clathrin in tissue specific pathways. But of course, since our pathways are so complex, especially in vertebrates, it really makes sense. So those are our thoughts now on how the, light chain diversity um, is working in, in clathrin function. Um, and now I'd like to turn to how heavy chain diversity has changed clathrin functions. So I mentioned that the gene duplication led to this second clathrin, CHC22, which does not bind the light chains at all. And um, I think, I'm not sure I said, but actually the sequences in these two heavy chains are much closer than the, the sequences of the two light chains, which only bind 17. So 22 and 17 are 85% identical in protein sequence. And the, a major difference, and those differences are scattered throughout the, throughout the protein. Um, a major difference is that 22 is shorter than 17 by 35 amino acids. It still trimerizes, still has the trimerization domain, but the C-terminus is slightly truncated. Now, the tissue specific expression of these of CHC22 is what ultimately led us to figure out what its function of was. It was found in the um, that in the human genome project quite some years ago. And um, people had even made knockout mice for CHC22 and couldn't find any phenotypes. Uh, uh, sorry, made um, sorry, scratch that. Um, <laughs> mice don't have CH222, which um, I'll come to. Um, people had not known what, people had made transgenic mice expressing CH222 and had not known what phenotypes to, to study because they didn't know what pathway it functioned in. So we started asking a number of years ago, what pathway does 22 function in? And uh, turn to membrane traffic pathways that are high in the tissues in which CHC22 expression is high, which are skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. And I'm going to talk about mostly our studies in skeletal muscle. Um, and so the, the pathways that are specific to those, um, oh, sorry, okay. 
let me just finish talking about the separate biochemistry of the two heavy chains before I talk about the function. Um, because that 85% identi identity and sequence gives different properties of the two uh, proteins. So the coats for 22 are more stable than 17. Um, and that's they're, when they're, because they're missing this um, C-terminal residues, they're missing the, the site that the uncoding protein recognizes. And so the mechanism for uncoding 22 is different and we've been characterizing that, but we're still not quite sure what different elements contribute to uncoding 22. They have separate intracellular localization and they bind different adapter molecules. Um, and then I mentioned that their tissue expression and also that the gene encoding CLT, uh, gene encoding CHT22, which is called CLT-CL1, is actually missing from mice. So it's present in humans, it's functional in humans, um, and I'll come back to uh, other species um, where um, 22 is present and absent and its function there. So it was the tissue specific expression then that led us to look at the function of 22 in humans. And um, that's what I'd like to just refresh you um, your memory about at the moment. So um, muscle and skeletal muscle and fat share a share um, the um, physiological processes of insulin responsive um, glucose import. And that of course is a critical physiological function for um, many organisms. And so how this works in humans is that um, you're, it's an interplay between what you eat and um, how your tissues dispose of that, um, the products of that food. And normally if you're fasting, your liver is making blood glucose to keep you going, to keep energy to your brain and to keep energy to your muscles. But when you eat a meal, your digestive system creates that carbohydrate, which then interacts with the pancreas, which produces insulin. And the insulin um, needs to clear that blood glucose because Re, um, retention of blood high co concentrations of blood glucose is toxic to the, to humans and other organisms. So insulin cause turns off the glucose production pathways of the liver, and it turns on pathways that take up glucose into the muscle and into the fat. And so um, you're probably all familiar with type one diabetes. Uh, which is juvenile onset diabetes, where um, the capacity to make insulin is um, lost because of autoimmune destruction of the pancreas. And then there's type two diabetes where you still make insulin, but the pathways of uptake of glucose into the muscle and into the fat are defective. Now those pathways are membrane traffic pathways. It's insulin regulated membrane traffic causes glucose uptake. And so that's what we started to, to look at to ask whether CHT22 is involved in that glucose uptake pathway, which is defective in type two diabetes. So the way this pathway works, it is um, all membrane traffic regulated. And in a fasting state, um, you have a glucose transporter that is made by the cell, and it's but it's retained inside an intracellular um, storage compartment, and the glucose transporter is um, called GLUT4. And so, when you um, have a meal and you produce insulin, and it interacts with the insulin receptor, um, an int intracellular signal is produced that causes the GLUT4 to be exported to the membrane, so that so that GLUT4 can now be at the plasma membrane and import glucose into that tissue. And this happens both in muscle and fat. And we discovered um, initially that you need CHT22 clathrin to package the GLUT4 inside that GLUT4 storage compartment. And um, at the moment, it seems like this is not an insulin regulated step because the insulin regulated step actually occurs um, by letting the GLUT4 out of that compartment, but you need the CHT22 clathrin to create that compartment. Um, okay, so in type two diabetes, which is initiated by um, insulin resistance, um, you got um, a phenomenon where GLUT4 builds up inside the cell. And what happens is the insulin binds insulin receptor 
but the intracellular signal is defective. And it's still not entirely clear what that defect is in type 2 diabetes. Um, and when you, that is um, defective, then the GLUT4 storage compartment does not let the GLUT4 out to the cell surface. So you don't get glucose import into the tissue. And um, that, causes, it, it, that also causes an expanded GLUT4 compartment because it's just sitting in there and it's not coming out in response to insulin. And of course, if you're not letting the GLUT4 out, then you accumulate glucose outside the cell. And that um, means it's not being cleared from the blood and that ultimately leads to the toxicity that affects in type two diabetes. So we looked at human patients who have type insulin resistant type two diabetes and you can look at their muscle and you can um, do immunofluorescence for GLUT4 and CHG22 clathrin. What you see is in a, a normal patient um, or control, um, you stain for GLUT4 and 22, and you can see some co-localization, and you can see that it's also perinuclear co-localization near the GLUT4 storage compartment. In type 2 diabetes, where GLUT4 builds up inside the muscle because you can't let it out in response to insulin, the CHE22 clathrin accumulates around that GLUT4, and so you see a much bigger GLUT4 compartment, and you can see CHE22 deposited on that compartment. So looking at the cartoon form that we've been looking at, that, we, that I was just showing you, you have no intracellular signal working and you're not letting your GLUT4 out. You're expanding the GLUT4 compartment. What seems to be happening is that CHC22 clathrin is aberrantly accumulating on that expanded GLUT4 compartment. So it's not, in, it's not part of the initial defect, but it seems to be accumulating um, outside the compartment, which um, might ultimately um, contribute to further insulin resistance by holding GLUT4 inside. So it was this association with the, in, the expanded GLUT4 compartment that really um, prompted us to find out what are the steps that CHG, what kind of transport is CHE22 mediating and where is it working in the cell? So we might understand a little bit more about the insulin resistant state. So the other um, side of the coin in these studies is that I mentioned that people had made mice in which they got CHT22 expression in, in murine muscle um, because mice, mice don't have that, but they put it on a muscle specific promoter and they didn't really know what was wrong with those mice until we found what pathway CHT22 works in. And then we got those mice and analyzed their blood and sure enough, they had elevated blood glucose. And if you look at their skeletal muscle, what you see is in, in a wild type muscle, this is the GLUT4 distribution and the distribution of other markers that are present in the GLUT4 storage compartment. You can see that, um, that in the CHC22 expressing mite, GLUT4 is accumulating inside the muscle of these mice, as are these other markers for that storage compartment. So we're, we're creating an expanded GLUT4 compartment by expressing CHG22 in mice. So um, we really then wanna know what is the pathway that CHG22 is working and how could this be happening? But, and we're thinking that in mice, there's a mouse pathway that's making this GLUT4 storage compartment, which I will come back to. But when you add in CHG22 clathrin to their muscle, you then have an increased, um, trafficking of GLUT4 to the storage compartment because you're adding in a new membrane traffic pathway. And that um, when fed, um, when the animals are fed and you get this intracellular signal, you actually have the CHE22 accumulating as it does in the human insulin resistance state around that compartment. And that leads to less GLUT4 coming out to the cell surface and the phenotypes that we see in the mice, which is higher blood glucose. So we're creating a sort of false um, insulin resistant situation when we put CHG22 into the animals by, create, by putting more GLUT4 into the storage compartment and then accumulating CHG22 around it. Um, so over, we then did some work over the next past 10 years or so about asking where is CHG22 actually working when it's working properly in human cells. And we found that it mediates two different pathways in human cells for delivering GLUT4 to the storage compartment. So here's the GLUT4 storage compartment. 
And when it is released, uh, when these insulin response vesicles are released to the cell surface, the GLUT4 is actually recaptured by CHC17, the normal clathrin, in normal receptor-mediated endocytosis. But we found that in order to divert the CHC22 back to the storage compartment, you need the activity of CHC22 sorting um, at the in the endosomal region and probably through the trans-Golgi network to replace that GLUT4. Um, we also found that CHC22 can directly divert GLUT4 from this ergic compartment um, to the GLUT4 storage compartment, bypassing the secretory pathway, uh, by bypassing the normal secretory pathway, so that much of what's made actually gets put immediately into the storage compartment. And there's evidence for that because you have delayed glycosylation of GLUT4 and uh, et cetera uh, that was already known. So this is a pathway that's well known, sort of endosomal sorting. And you could imagine how and some, some of these endosomal sorting pathways are mediated by CHC22 clathrin, so uh, CHC17 clathrin. So you can imagine that maybe in humans, CHC22 replaces CHC17 with a higher adapter affinity, and it can do this sorting. But this sorting in the ergic was, a, was very puzzling to us because no one had shown any kind of clathrin function in the early secretory pathway. So we went out of our way to try and um, confirm that CHC22 is diverting um, GLUT4 from the ergic. And we turned to, um, we, we first um, showed that CHC22 actually associates with two different um, sorting complexes. So in order for it to mediate the sorting endosome, it interacts with, um, with this B, with the molecules in this B complex here, which include um, some of the same adapters that CHC17 uses. So it does look like 22 competes with 17 for sorting back to the um, GSC from the endosome. And that, that adapt, main adapter operating here are GIGA2 and AP1, which people may have heard of as clathrin adapters. Um, on the other hand, we found a separate complex that CHC22 participates in that involves the P115 molecule, which is a, a tether molecule that's present in the ergic and association with IRAP, which actually binds both GLUT4 and P115. So um, the biochemistry suggested that this uh, CHE22 could interact with a complex that might function here. And we turned to, um, mapping its function using bacteria as probes. So we went to, a, um, we um, it was actually fortuitous that when I moved my laboratory from UCSF to UCL, my lab space was taken over by Sherry Mukherjee, who was a young um, investigator who was studying a bacteria called um, um, Legionella pneumophila. And, um, as as we were making transition, moving the lab, I left some post left Stefan Camus behind. He was one of the postdocs in the lab, and he started talking to Sherry and realizing that this Legionella pneumophila, when it infects cells, um, when you have a a, um, a a viable bacterium, it goes into a replication vacuole. Um, it gets endocytosed, but it quickly remodels the membrane of that endocytic pathway by stealing membrane from the ergic in order to sequester itself away from the normal degradative uh, endosomal pathway um, in order for it to create a replication vacuole. So it requires traffic of ergic membranes to a, its, its replication vacuole. And if you have a a virulent bacteria that doesn't have these effector proteins that make this happen, um, it gets degraded in the lysosomal pathway. So Stefan thought, well, maybe if CHC22 is involved in ergic traffic um, to, of GLUT4 to the GSC, which is another intracellular organelle, perhaps it's involved here in this replication vacuole. And that would show that CHC22 membrane traffic actually emerges from the ergic. So he, um, in collaboration with Sherry, um, we infected um, HeLa cells that um, with that were expressing fluorescent G uh, CHC22 and fluorescent CHC17 with these Legionella bacteria. So we have a wild-type Legionella, which is um, labeled with uh, 
a red dye. And it, you can see there's one here, there's a tiny little one where this arrow is pointing and you can see a blow up of that. And if you have fluorescent CHC22 in that cell, you can see that it accumulates, this is the 22 is green, the bacterium is red. You can see they, it accumulates around the bacterium and you get a yellow signal here around the bacterium. If you have a mutant bacterium that doesn't go, that doesn't steal ergic membrane, then it goes into the cell and it doesn't accumulate CHC22. If you look at CHC17, which is the uh, conventional clathrin, um, it does not accumulate around the bacteria. So um, we can um, quantify that and the percent of vacuoles that are standing positive for CHC22 are shown here. And it's reduced when you have a mutant um, Legionella bacterium. So, um, we also showed that if you knock down CHC22, it prevents the vacuole from acquiring ER proteins, and it also prevents intravacular vacuolar replication of the bacteria. So it looks like that this, this study confirms that CHC22 mediates traffic coming out of the ergic to other intracellular compartments. So we felt more comfortable having shown biochemically that this is in a complex that could localize to the ergic, it also can mediate um, membrane export from the ergic to another compartment. And um, can and now are, are um, confident that there's two pathways that CHT22 mediates to the GLUT4 compartment, one from the sorting endosomes and one from the ergic. So this helps us understand, see, um, visualize, a think about what's happening then in the mice. So in, in mouse GLUT4 traffic, um, there's been many, many studies of mouse of GLUT4 traffic in murine uh, fat cells, actually. And um, what they've shown is that it, the main pathway that targets GLUT4 to the, its storage compartment is mediated by CHC17 both its uptake from the cell surface, which it does also in humans, but also by the sorting endosome. So CHC17 is the major player in forming the mouse um, GLUT4 pathway. And we think there's evidence of a minor pathway that's coming from the ergic, but when we add in CHC22 in the transgenic mice, now we're enhancing both pathways that are leading to putting GLUT4 in its storage compartment. We're expanding the amount of GLUT4 in that compartment and accumulating CHC22 and leading to that trapping phenotype that we see in the mice. So what we're seeing is that when you put this into mice who don't have the gene, um, it's leading to um, aberrant GLUT4 traffic. So this really leads us to an evolutionary paradox. Um, in humans, CHC22 controls a specialized pathway for GLUT4 storage and you need it to create that pathway in muscle and fat. Um, but when GLUT4 is expanded in, during insulin resistance, CHC22 accumulates at that expanded compartment. And um, we know that it's missing from mice. And when CHC22 is introduced into mice, it promotes insulin resistance. So we thought it would be really interesting to look at the evolution of the CHC genes to try and understand what's going on with this um, clathrin control of glucose metabolism. So um, I collaborated with I, this. Um, I was fortunate with, in my move to UCL that um, I was um, now affiliated with a number of bio, bio, biosciences departments. And one of my departments is um, genetics, evolution, and environment. And so there are a lot of terrific evolutionary cell biologists. And Matteo Fumagalli um, joined the project to try and look at um, the distribution of clathrin heavy chain genes in different species to understand this evolutionary paradox. And so um, we're able to mine the genomes of 50 different species, at, and that was a few years ago, so there's probably even more now. And in order to do this um, kind of study, you need the genomes to be pretty much 99% complete. So we threw out all the ones that were not very well characterized. And what we found is that um, in looking at the genes for conventional clathrin, which is CLTC, every single vertebrate species that we looked at, and non-vertebrates as well, have a gene encoding uh, conventional clathrin heavy chain. And 
Um, some of them have more than one, particularly bony fishes, which have um, complicated gene duplication during their evolution. But if you look at the gene encoding C, uh, CHC22, CLTCL1, there's quite a few gaps in here showing that the gene is missing from a number of evolutionary branches. And it turns out that we can find that it appeared um, when vertebrates emerged. Um, and so it's present in the ghost shark, but not in the lamprey. But it's um, was lo then lost in several lineages. So it's been lost in the um, part of the rodent, rodent lineage. So mice and rats do not have it. But it's also been, um, it's been very highly changed in the um, horse lineage. And it's been um, lost in the um, lineage that leads to um, a lot of the ruminants. So sheep, cows, pigs, um, a lot of the animals whose um, flesh is consumed as meat, actually. So, um, so CHE22 has been also lost in that branch. Um, so we decided, so this signature of gene loss um, after appearance is suggested of, um, it's basically recent evolution and the fact that the, that the gene hasn't really actually settled um, to its evolutionary um, sort of capacity and that it's still under, and we were and we, so we looked for evidence to, to ask whether um, the gene is undergoing changes um, in modern vertebrates. And so we looked at human populations, which is an obvious thing to do, um, because we could mine the thousand genome project. And we looked at the variation of the uh, conventional clathrin heavy chain, CLTC, in humans and the variation of CLT, CL1, encoding CHT22. And that's because um, if the gene is still undergoing changes, we thought we might see diversity in the human population. And so what these diagrams show is that each circle shows the number of alleles present at that at, at that particular locus. And a large circle means a single allele that you can see. And so, and then this breaks down the, the presence of that allele in various human populations. So what you can see is for conventional clathrin, there's pretty much a single allele and it's present in all the human populations that we looked at. There are maybe some minor, minor variants. These are actually tenfold um, scaled up so you can even see the lollipops. So there's har there's hardly any variation in CHC17 and it's very conservative. In CHC22, what we found is there's two major alleles plus a few other changing alleles, um, when you, which you can see by the size of the circles um, derived from these. And these two major alleles differ by only one amino acid. And interestingly, they're actually both present in all the populations that we tested. So that means that this allele arose quite some time ago in human evolution. And um, so we were able to um, look at ancient human DNA and found that even in um, the Denisovan genome, which is one of the um, Neanderthal genomes, um, we could find evidence of this variant in that population. So it looks like this variant arose a very long time ago, and then humans diversified into the populations that we know today. So, um, when, so the big a big question is, um, what's the difference, the functional difference between these two alleles, and why would we have this this um, a, you know, selection for two of them in the human population. So we've done a lot of biochemistry and cell biology comparing the two different alleles of CHC22. And we found that the original allele, um, which has a methionine at position 1316, which is in the region that would affect clathrin assembly, um, it's much more effective for generating insulin responsive GLUT4 vesicles. So we can knock down CHC22 and replace it with one allele versus the other. And we can show we get a better GLUT4 response if we have um, the CHC22 M allele. Um, and we see that GLUT4 is more protected from degradation by the M allele. And so, and the turnover of the M allele is slower than that of the V allele or 17. So all of these properties 
contribute to the fact that the M allele is better at retaining or trafficking GLUT4 to its GLUT storage compartment and um, than the V allele. So the V allele lets more GLUT4 out spontaneously. And in that case, glucose clearance would be favored by the V allele. So why would you wanna favor glucose clearance and why would this allele become, uh, which emerged um, as in ancient humans, why would it become so prevalent in the human population during the period of human evolution? So we thought perhaps that this allele, um, because it let more GLUT4 out, would be more favorable for dealing with carbohydrate in the diet. And of course, humans changed um, from being hunter-gatherer people to being people who were farming and eating carbohydrates and cooking and releasing more carbohydrates um, uh, during, hum during uh, human evolution. So we were able to look at um, some modern populations of farmers versus hunter-gatherers, which are hard to find because there aren't that many hunter-gatherer populations left anymore. But we're also able to look at ancient Eurasian populations where there is some ancient DNA that you could look at. And what we found is that there seems to be a trend of um, an increase of the V allele in the farming population versus the hunter-gatherer population. So it looks like there is an increase of the presence of that allele in human populations as they started to farm and or cook, which it's hard to figure out um, which of those big activities it maps to, because we're talking about quite a number of years ago, which is um, five to 10 uh, kilo, thousand years ago. So, um, so, what that's telling us now is that even that CHE22 clathrin um, is really um, evidence for evolution in action. Uh, it's been lost in some vertebrate species, uh, which form their GLUT4 compartment differently. There's high variation in the human population um, and during phylogeny. Um, there's correlation of allele selection with human dietary changes that increase carbohydrate availability like farming and cooking. Um, so that so that the allele became more embedded in the population between um, 500,000 years ago when it appeared and and ancient farmers, which you can map to five to 10,000 years ago. So we um, see some evidence that it's been embedded in the population because of changes in diet. And looking at other species, um, such as polar bears, um, we find that they have a very um, different version of CHC22, which, um, and they eat a diet that is virtually devoid of carbohydrate. And actually another variant of CHC22 has appeared in Inuit Greenlander humans who also have a, a diet, a very high fat, low carbohydrate diet um, in, in their, in their um, very similar to that of polar bears. They live in a similar environment. So um, what we're thinking is that CHC22 was useful for ancient humans because it gave you a robust GLUT4 um, response, but it could retain your GLUT4 well inside the muscle until you needed it to keep your brain going um, and your muscles going um, so that you could keep um, high, you could keep your blood glucose um, high in order to look for food, et cetera. But then as we started eating more carbohydrate, it's really important to have a more Easy, easy to have the glute, to have the glucose more easily cleared and let your glute flow out more let readily. So we have now in our population a variant that is a little less good at holding your glute flow in and packaging it inside the muscle. So I've told you today about um, how the duplication of genes encoding light chains resulted in isoforms that cooperate and balance each other's roles in neurons and epithelia and then um, how duplication of genes encoding heavy chains generated two clathrins, one retaining basic function and the other still undergoing selection by diet for metabolic function. But that's really important for humans, uh, for human uh, glucose metabolism. So all this, um, what I've been telling you today is the culmination of many, many, many years of work from my laboratory at uh, University of California, San Francisco, before I moved to London about 10 years ago. And um, uh, I mentioned as I went along that those working on the Catherine light chain diversity and those working on the heavy chain diversity. 
And um, we've had wonderful collaborators over the years who are noted here, and I've been supported by all of these generous funding agencies as well over the years. So I'd be happy to answer any questions from you, and um, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Frances. Uh, super great. Uh, there are already some questions in a question and answer. The first one from Neeraj, uh, does Catherine protein have a free site? Uh, to add a specific adapter in order to deliver specific drugs, if one want to. Yeah, so does Clathrin have a, well, I missed the second part of that sentence. Does Clathrin protein have any free sites to add specific aptamers to, for a drug delivery system or something like that? Or can you see uh, use of Clathrin's more into like drug delivery yeah, that's an interesting question. So conventional clathrin, so the path, so clathrin, of course, is an intracellular protein. So you'd have to, so if you're going to use it for drug delivery, you more want to take advantage of the pathways that it mediates, bringing things into the cell, as opposed to targeting the clathrin itself. Although nowadays you can do intracellular targeting. Um, so people have thought about targeting clathrin mediated pathways over the year. That's your basic receptor mediated endocytosis mm -hmm. pathway. So you can target extracellular things there. Um, intracellularly, it's an interesting idea that you might be able to localize an intracellular drug to that GLUT4 compartment by somehow attachment to CHC22. And that's something that we haven't really explored. We'd be very interested in inhibiting CHC22. Uh, it's uh, inhibiting its accumulation during insulin resistance as a drug target, but um, that would be um, not something that we could do right at the moment. So, uh, Francis, how do uh, the different variants of uh, CHC22, you mentioned that there are quite a few variants which are found across the population. So how does that correlate with, uh, you know, accumulation and also diabetes? Yeah, so that's a great question. So <laughs> we looked at the GWAS studies for type 2 diabetes. And CHC22 is not amongst the genes that appears in those studies. But from the, what we know about how it functions in muscle, um, I don't think it would be causative of diabetes, but I think it could make symptoms worse. So I think it could exacerbate insulin resistance once you've already got it. And so we're just entering a collaboration with the group of Cambridge a group at Cambridge who can measure, um, actually can measure, can feed people <laughs> special diets and then measure glucose metabolism. And, and they can look at obese people versus um, normal people and look at what, how about at their insulin resistance, insulin secretion levels and uh, sorry, uh, glute four clearance levels and things like that. So I think what we're talking, so it wasn't, there's no direct genetic correlation, but I think that's because it's exacerbating and not causative. And I'm really excited about being able to start these studies in humans. Uh, there are some more questions more related to CHC22, uh, spe uh, especially uh, how the cage formation is regulated. Is it just the self polymerization or does it require any other uh, factors to induce the uh, polymerization order? It's a really good question. Um, so for CHC17, just to make to put in the picture, if you take if you purify that clathrin, it will self-assemble, but you have to drop the pH. And if you add adapters, um, biochemical, you know, if you add the purified adapters, you can then assemble it at physiological pH. We it's been very difficult to purify CHC22 because of getting um, a tissue source. And we're just in the process of being able to express it in, in uh, insect cells and purify it. Um, we Evidence looks like it will self-assemble. And so um, just spontaneously. So, but how that's regulated in the cell and what the pH, what the pH and salt requirements are, we don't, we don't know yet. Um, and, and an interesting uh, and whether there's actually it's re whether it's for example it's regulated by association with p115 which is seems to be part of its adapter complex um we also don't know yet but um it's something we're actively looking into uh shubham wants to know like is there any um uh, 
uh, effect of local environment, like some epigenetic regulations of CHC22, uh, which you mm. observed during in your mouse studies or something? We have not even looked at that. Um, no. I mean, it's really, there's a lot of epigenetic modifications that occur from diabetic mothers to children. And so it would be really interesting to look at that. But, um, you're ahead of your time. Yeah. And uh, I think one more question where um, I think the mortality is observed in CTLA knockout mice. So uh, is it something to do with the the uh, role of these light chains during early development, maybe something just to, in terms of like perturbing the metabolism itself. Like I think I, I expect that. Oddly, no. So if you look at the number of pups, so the, 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 the mortality is postnatal. So we've, it's, we've mapped it to the first few days of life of, of these animals. So they have a, no, a normal number of pups to begin with, and then they, and then 50% die. And we do think it might be a nutritional problem. So, so light chains in particular are really important for clathrin mediated uptake of G protein coupled receptors. And so um, you can you can get rid of light chains and clathrin will still sort of work in cells, but not very well. Um, but GPCR seem to be light chain dependent. And so that could be that could explain problems in um the pups finding where to nurse because they need all these, they need hormonal signals to do that. It could also be problems in, in their metabolism that are regulated by G-protein coupled receptors. But, so something is happening in those postnatal days that's, that 50% of them die, but then those that survive that period and somehow compensate are able to go on and develop. So, and then they don't show those developmental defects until the females show this uterine defect way later in life. So there's something that's happening that's compensatory or something serious that causes them to die. And I think nutrition is a good hypothesis there. Uh, Ashish wants to know, uh, I mean, he's interested in knowing like, is there like, since you have done a lot of proteomics, is there any a uh, particular post-translation modification, which is associated with tissue-specific activity of clathrins? Like, have you figured out like some glycosylation or something? Um, so that we have looked into phosphorylation of clathrin heavy chain quite some time, quite some years ago. Um, the heavy chain is a target for Sark family kinases. And that seems to contribute to heavy chain activity at the edge of raft domains in the membrane for clearing um, signaling receptors. So the signaling receptors that associate with Sark family kinases phosphorylate the heavy chain. Th that causes the heavy chain to remain accumulated at the raft domains and be non-functional, pr presumably till it's dephosphorylated. So we've focused on phosphorylation. We haven't come back to that over the past number of years, but that seems to occur for um, many signaling receptors that associate with Sark family kinases. So um, including, um, oh gosh, well, we did it for the immune receptors, T cell receptor and B cell receptor, but there are other receptors. Oh, I'm blanking on which other ones that have, it's been shown for. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just blanking, but it, uh, we've written about it in a review. <laughs> If you if you're continue to be interested, yeah. Uh, uh, Shivani wants to know, like, if uh, like a lot of uh, studies are there for like uh, cytosolic trafficking, how it works, but do we know anything uh, about how uh, the molecules are specifically targeted in nucleus? Like, there is anything active nuclear trafficking? Thing? Yeah, there's a lot known about nuclear import, which is um, which is these really complicated and beautiful nuclear port channels, um, and and also for for importing um, things that have nuclear localization signals. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's it is, it's a big area of, of memory traffic, or I don't know if it's really it is memory is it's at least organelle targeting. <laughs> I don't I don't know. It's sort of memory traffic. It's crossing the memory. And uh, Subbara wants to know, is, is there any differential sorting rate between clathrin 17 and 22 uh, on of GLUT4 vesicles? Like, is there like... Oh, that's interesting. Sorting rate. Um, 
so that would be in different parts of the pathway, but we haven't really looked at, at that. There is, I mean, we the only rate related thing we've looked at is that CHC 17 is very, um, it, it's very labile. It will come on and off membranes quite easily. So, so when you look at how much clathrin there is in the cell, about 50% of the 17 is in the cytosol and 50% is membrane bound. If you do the same study for 22, most of 22 is always membrane associated and very little is floating around in, in the cytosol. So um, it's less labile. And then between the two variants, the M is st more stuck to membranes than the, than the V is. So um, there's definitely changes in the turnover of the clathrins. And presumably in that case, um, probably the rate of formation of clathrin coated vesicles, but we haven't measured it. Um, uh, I think some more last question, maybe, uh, do you know if uh, CLCs are also involved in actin mediated pathways and how they function over there? Yeah, good, great question. So, um, so the hip, so, so they both, both A and B bind the hip proteins, um, which um, influence actin assembly um, and, um, we believe that that functions at the stage where the clathrin coated vesicle is pinching off from the plasma membrane. Um, HIP and for CLCA, HIP is competed away by myosin 6A variant in epithelial cells. And when you disrupt that interaction with myosin 6A in epithelial cells, you affect the number of coated vesicles that can form at the apical side of those cells. So it seems to be, and, and it, the apical side requires more actin activity for uptake of cargo because the apical side is um, under higher tension. So, um, so, it's, so it's linking membrane traffic to actin activity that then controls that membrane traffic. Um, and that's about as far as we know so far. Okay, good. Um, maybe we can take the last question uh, from Amit, where he's talking. Uh, he's asking, um, is there anything uh, known about how the adapter proteins are interacting with clathrin triskeletal uh, skeleton, like the AP1, AP2 proteins? Yes, yes, great. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so um, the adapter proteins bind the terminal domain, which is the end terminus, so the end that's opposite to the trimerization domain, the globular domain that sticks up, that's at the end of all the three legs. And there have been several, there have been four molecular sites that have been mapped that interact with different adapters on 17. Um, we have a whole new study about CHC22 that shows two things. It binds adapters differently. Um, it actually recruits a protein at its C terminus called sortignexid 5, which binds P115. So that recruits, it gives it half of a recruitment site to the ergic. And then its terminal domain has a different patch on it that also recognizes P115. So while CHT17 is recruited to membranes by, by um, what looks like a, can be a single interaction with its terminal domain with an adapter molecule, CHC22 depends on both a binding, an indirect binding through its C term through its C terminus and a direct binding through its N terminal domain at a novel site. So um we that we just put that study about the CHC22 on bioarchive and um if you're interested in further details of how that works. May I ask one question? So you mentioned that when you uh, have both light chains, you have greater budding efficiency. So I was wondering, so it's a, it's a mixed lattice or is it a mixed triskelion or both? Um, I think in the reality, it's a mixed triskelion because from everything we've done, it, it looks like when you have, you know, say two thirds A and one third B, your, the, the, the triskelia have two thirds A, one third B. So, tech, so they could have, you know, two A's and a B. Most of, most of them probably have two A's and a B, but you can have all A's and all B's. The way we did that study, 
is we made A clathrin and B clathrin and mixed it together. And effectively that's, um, um, it's, that is how we did it. Yeah, but so, so we think that, um, which is what would also happen in cells because you do have all A and all B clathrin, but I think you also have the mixed ones, which we couldn't really control. So I so you need the cooperativity between them for that process. And I don't know, you know, what it is about the two that is important for that geometry at all. But that's that is a diff, that is how it, so there is a difference in the reality in cells and how we did that reconstitution study because we were missing the mixed triskelia in the reconstitution study. So in the reconstitution study, you haven't been able to see, let's say, a swapping out of A or B from specific Aeschylia? That's um, We could, but we can't. We don't really know. I mean, you could reconstitute clathrin with two-thirds A and one-third B, and then just, then you're going to get four Change triskelia. Change the concentration, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you, I mean, so, yeah, so we never did ratios like that, which would be a really nice study. <laughs> um, I'd love to do that, but we probably are. Presumably gonna... one could predict that in vivo when, uh, you know, you swap out A for B, you know, you mm. could change either the trafficking rate or specificity for certain receptors, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, context dependent uh, regulation of a pathway. Right, that's what I think. And not only that, you're changing the proteins that are recruited by the clathrins as well. Because when you have more, you know, when you have equal A and B, it's yeah. different than having mostly A and very little B. And so, because the B is attenuating yeah. the A. And I think, I think the synaptic vesicle experiment, you know, is a really lucky one because you show that it becomes unregulated when you have A only and you don't have any B. And when you have only B, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, so you get, so that those are the kind of two extremes. But I don't know if that's, biophysical or also due to bound proteins, you know, we, that we couldn't really pick apart. Great. All right, I think um, this has been an absolutely fantastic uh, talk and thank you so much, Francis. Um, all the participants have really, really enjoyed themselves. Uh, there is a feedback form for participants, so please fill that out so that, uh, you know, we can help record the feedback. And uh, once again, on behalf of all the organizers and all the participants, thank you very much, Francis.